In this unit on Christian mysticism, I have been pursuing several themes. Christian mysticism's variety in social location and gender, its grounding in the Incarnation and the Eucharist, its emphasis on asceticism, in which celibacy or virginity is matched by strong, effective language toward God, appropriating the erotic language used by human lovers and of Scripture in the Song of Songs to express this most intense of relationships. All these themes reappear as we look today at mendicants as mystics. The word mendicant means a beggar, someone who lives poorly and by means of begging from others in order to sustain his life, the basic necessities of life. And in the high Middle Ages, religious orders called mendicants arose representing a response to changing social and ecclesial circumstances. And within those orders, powerful mystical teaching was generated. Externally, the growth of cities helped foster, on one side, the plague in Europe, but on the other side, a, a generated a, a, a body of urban poor who needed care. Islam was, by this time, well ascendant and was a tremendous spiritual and intellectual challenge both to Judaism and Christianity. It's not entirely surprising that the Christian mendicants, the wandering begging orders, arose at the time of the Sufis' wandering begging, begging orders as well. It matched Islam's self-presentation of the poor. Internal to the life of the church, monasteries were inadequate to meet pastoral needs, and local clergy were morally and intellectually incompetent. The rise of the mendicant orders and that of the great medieval universities, Bologna in 1088, Paris in 1160, Oxford in 1167, go together in a spiritual and intellectual response to the church's needs. The two largest mendicant orders are called the Franciscans and the Dominicans. Each had extraordinary founders with quite similar visions. Both Francis of Assisi, whose dates are 1181 to 1226, and Dominic of Calaruega, whose dates are 1170 to 1221, were committed to a radical ideal of evangelical poverty. They took seriously the words of Jesus to sell their possessions and follow him. And so they uh, wanted to survive, they and their followers, by means of begging. And at the same time, to carry out not a withdrawn life, but an active ministry among the poor. Each of them spent himself in missionary travel, you know, founding houses, working, and so forth. They founded organizations or orders committed to active ministry, and each of them struggled with the consequences of phenomenal growth. They became very popular and very numerous at the same time. Both generated second-order female members who tended to live more enclosed lives, and third-order associates, lay people, who shared the ideals of the founders. Most of all, both the Dominicans and the Franciscans struggled with maintaining institutional poverty as well as individual poverty. As I, as I mentioned in an earlier presentation, it's a paradox of life together that highly energetic and frugal people tend to get rich. Um, and so as, as the Franciscans and the Dominicans became more institutionally complex, their orders tended to thrive. And this in particular was a problem for the Franciscans and split the Franciscan order um, very early on because of a disagreement about how much institutional wealth was compatible with an, a, a commitment to evangelical poverty. Let me look first at Franciscan spirituality. It is deeply marked by the character of its founder, Francis, one of the most charismatic figures in the history of Christianity. The pattern of Francis's life, the abandonment of his personal wealth, 
his life among the poor, has been seen before. We saw it in the case of St. Anthony, uh, the, one of the first desert fathers who sold all that he possessed and gave it away and went to live uh, in the wilderness. But in the case of Francis, the giving away of the possessions did not lead to a withdrawal to the wilderness, but a further participation and identification with the life of the poor. And the passionate character of his devotion to the poverty of Christ as found in the lowliest of the earth. The, his belief in the incarnation was that Christ was the poverello, the poor one, and that Christ was to be found most among the poor ones in society. This was distinctive. This was really something new within Christianity. His mysticism, his, identify, his identification with the crucified Christ, because that's how he saw a Christ among the poor as suffering, um, took place on September 14th um, in 1224. He was at Mount Laverna when he had a vision of Christ crucified and in that vision received the stigmata, or is sometimes pronounced stigmata, the wounds of Christ in his hands and feet and side, um, which he bore for the rest of his life. This experience is described by his close follower, Bonaventure, of whom I will speak in a moment, who wrote in his Life of St. Francis, by the seraphic ardor of his desires, seraphic means like seraphim, the angels, the angelic desire, he was being borne aloft into God. And by his sweet compassion, he was being transformed into him who chose to be crucified because of the excess of his love. On a certain morning about the feast of the exaltation of the cross, while Francis was praying on the mountainside, he saw a seraph, an angel, with six fiery and shining wings descend from the height of heaven. And when in swift flight the seraph had reached a spot in the air near the man of God, there appeared between the wings the figure of a man crucified, with his hands and feet extended in the form of a cross and fastened to a cross. He rejoiced because of the gracious way Christ looked upon him under the appearance of the seraph, but the fact that he was fastened to a cross pierced his soul with a sword of compassionate sorrow. So his identification with the crucifixion of Christ was so powerful that it resulted in this physiological response of the stigmata. Francis wrote very little, a few letters, a rule, but he is universally admired and often quoted for his beautiful canticle of the brother son. Most high, all-powerful, good Lord, yours are the praises, the glory, the honor, and all blessing. To you alone, most high, do they belong, and no man is worthy to mention your name. Praise be you, my Lord, with all your creatures, especially Sir Brother Son, who is the day and through whom you give us light. And he is beautiful and radiant with great splendor and bears a likeness of you, most high one. Praise be you, my Lord, through Sister Moon and the stars. In heaven you form them clear and precious and beautiful. Praise to you, my Lord, through Brother Wind and through the air, cloudy and serene and every kind of weather through which you give us sustenance to your creatures. Praise to you, my Lord, through Sister Water, which is very useful and humble and precious and chaste. Praise be you, my Lord, through Brother Fire, through whom you light the night. And he is beautiful and playful and robust and strong. Praise be you, my Lord, through our sister, Mother Earth, who sustains and governs us and who produces varied fruits with colored flowers and herbs. Praise be you, my Lord, through those who give pardon for your love and bear infirmity and tribulation. Blessed are those who endure in peace, for by you, Most High, shall they be crowned. Praise be you, my Lord, through our sister bodily death, from whom no living man can escape. Woe to those who die in mortal sin. Blessed are those whom death shall find in your most holy will, for the second death shall do them no harm. Praise and bless my Lord and give him thanks and serve him with great humility. Often Francis is regarded as kind of a nature mystic, but it's quite clear when we listen to this hymn that it is God who is being praised for all of God's creative works and notice the unflinching embrace of mortal death.
the sister death, of the death of the mortal body. Throughout this medieval period, we must remember that what might appear to us from the comfort of the 21st century first world to be a masochistic uh, fascination with suffering, with the death of Christ, with the passion of Christ, was deeply understandable in an age when people died very young, when they suffered greatly from physical ailments, when there were no anesthetics, where childbirth was frequent and difficult. The identification of mystics with the suffering of Christ um, is not only deeply understandable in that context, but it is uh, w- something that perhaps um, can be appreciated when one turns one's gaze away from the highly commodified and commercial world of the 21st century and looks at the lowly ones of the earth today. Francis had as his associate a young woman, Claire, um, also from Assisi, whose dates were 1193 to 1254, and she founded the second order of the Franciscans, the female order, called the Poor Clares, who again continued to work um, among the poor um, and carry out this same um, mission among the poor that uh, they were founded to do. She combines simplicity of life and style with a passionate love for Christ. She writes to a woman named Agnes of Prague, I give thanks to the giver of grace from whom we believe every good and perfect gift proceeds, because he has adorned you with such splendors of virtue and signed you with such marks of perfection. This is the perfection that will prompt the king himself to take you to himself in the heavenly bridal chamber. Here again, now we have this bridal language among women religious, where he is seated in glory on a starry throne because you have despised the splendors of an earthly kingdom and considered of little value the offers of an imperial marriage. Instead, as someone zealous for the holiest poverty, in the spirit of great humility and the most ardent charity, you have held fast to the footprints of him to whom you have merited to be joined as a spouse. Agnes of Prague was obviously a noble woman who had the possibility of a royal marriage, and she turned her back on that wealth and prestige in order to join the poor Clares, and Clare is praising her for that sort of devotion and assuring her that that commitment of celibacy and poverty is one that will give her the reward of a special relationship with the bridegroom, who is Christ. Franciscan spirituality finds its full and perfect expression in Bonaventure, Bonaventura. He is born John of Fidanza, His dates are 1221 to 1274. He was a learned man. He taught at the University of Paris. He was a competent man. He became general of the order. He was a bishop. He was a cardinal who attended the Unity Council of Lyon in 1274. And he was himself a great mystic. He wrote Two Lives of Francis the longer of which expresses much of Bonaventure's own spirituality, which he termed seraphic spirituality, and he is sometimes called the seraphic father for that constant image of the seraphim that he uses. The soul's journey into God is one of the great masterpieces of spirituality in the West, clearly is Bonaventure's masterpiece, Um, It is a model of theological and mystical compression, which links Francis's mysticism to medieval, Eastern, and even Islamic spirituality. It brings a great deal together and is notable, especially, I think, for the way in which it emphasizes the affective dimension of Franciscan spirituality. Franciscan spirituality does not emphasize the mind doesn't emphasize the cognitive, it emphasizes the heart, love of God. This work on the soul's journey into God has seven chapters, various stages of ascent, notice, using a very traditional model. The stages of ascent to God through the vestiges of God that are seen in the universe. Secondly, the vestiges of God in the sense world. Thirdly, 
through the contemplation of God in his image stamped in our natural powers, such as thinking. Fourth, contemplating God in his image reformed by the gifts of grace. Five, contemplating the divine unity through its primary name, which is being, so contemplating the very existence of God. Six, contemplating the blessed Trinity in its name, which is good. And that's seventh, on spiritual and mystical ecstasy in which rest is given to our intellect, when through ecstasy our affection passes over entirely into God. In other words, the mind can bring you just so far. This is fundamentally the same thing that Dionysius the Areopagite said. And he has a section in this seventh stage in which his language is quite distinctive and, and interesting, because he says, this was shown also to Blessed Francis, he goes back to his founder and his hero, when in ecstatic contemplation on the height of the mountain, where I thought out these things I have written, there appeared to him a six-winged seraph fastened to a cross, as I and several others heard in that very place from his companion who was with him then. There he passed over into God, in ecstatic contemplation. I want you to attend to this phrase, passed over, because it is a phrase that is technical within Sufi mysticism, the fana. Here it is found in this Franciscan mystic. He passed over into God in ecstatic contemplation and became an example of perfect contemplation as he had previously been of action. So that through him, more by example than by word, God might invite all truly spiritual men to this kind of passing over and spiritual ecstasy. He says, in this passing over, if it is to be perfect, all intellectual activities must be left behind. And the height of our affection must be totally transferred and transformed into God. This, however, is mystical and most secret, which no one knows except him who receives it. And no one receives it except him who desires it. And no one desires except him who is inflamed in his very marrow by the fire of the Holy Spirit, whom Christ sent into the world. And therefore the apostle says that this mystical wisdom is revealed by the Holy Spirit. We find here a real linking between Christian and Muslim mysticism in the figure of Bonaventure. This does not mean that Bonaventure loses his focus upon the Incarnation. In his book, The Tree of Life, he meditates on the various moments of Christ's life up to his death. Believing, hoping, and loving with my whole heart, with my whole mind, and with my whole strength, may I be carried to you, beloved Jesus, as to the goal of all things, because you alone are sufficient, you alone are good and pleasing to those who seek you and love your name. For you, my good Jesus, are the Redeemer of the lost, the Savior of the redeemed, the hope of exiles, the strength of laborers, the sweet solace of anguished spirits, the crown and imperial dignity of the triumphant, the unique reward and joy of all the citizens of heaven, the renowned offspring of the supreme God and the sublime fruit of the virginal womb, the abundant fountain of all graces of whose fullness we have all received. The, the, the mysticism of Francis, the mysticism of Bonaventure, the mysticism of the mendicant order called the Franciscans is the mysticism of the heart. At a certain point, the mind must give up and the passing over, the leap to the divine presence is made through love. In contrast, Dominican spirituality is marked by a very strong intellectual emphasis. As we find in the Dominican Theologians at the University of Paris, Albert the Great from 1200 to 1280, and his student Thomas Aquinas, 1225 to 1274, and in the three great Dominican mystics of 13th and 14th century Germany, whom I will briefly summarize in the remainder of this presentation. These three mystics are sometimes called the Rhineland mystics. They um, all have connections with the University of Paris in one way or another. They are all obviously um, from the Rhineland. They are all Dominicans, and they are all highly intellectual in their approach to the mystical life. 
The first and the most influential of the three line Rhineland Dominican mystics is Eckhart von Hochheim, who is often referred to simply as Meister Eckhart. His dates are 1260 to 1328. He taught at Paris and Cologne, the two great universities. His more technical theological works were written in Latin, but extant also are some of his sermons in German. Eckhart was extraordinarily bold in his expression. He used negative theology in the way of Dionysius. And his paradoxical style and his speculation on the birth of God's word in the human soul led him to charges of heresy. And he was brought to trial for heresy. And this darkened his last days. Uh, between 1327 and 1328, he spent much of his time trying to defend his teaching before inquisitors who wanted to you know, excommunicate him as a heretic. His sermons provide a sense of how exciting and disturbing his statements could be. He says, for example, in one of his sermons, sermon number two, And I have often said that there is a power in the soul that touches neither time nor flesh. It flows from the Spirit and remains in the Spirit and is wholly spiritual. In this power, God is always verdant and blossoming in all the joy and honor that he is in himself. If the Spirit were always united with God in this power, the man could never grow old. For that now in which God made the first man, and the now in which the last man will have his end, and the now in which I am talking, they are all the same in God, and there is not more than the one now. In other words, the soul by its very being participates in eternity. And so he's establishing this very close connection between the human soul and God. God's being, he says, is my life in Sermon 6. If my life is God's being, then God's existence must be my existence. And God's isness is my isness, neither less nor more. We come here very close to the kind of extraordinary paradox that we will find is in Sufi mystics like Halaj. So should the just soul be equal with God and close beside God, equal beside him, not beneath or above? Who are they who are thus equal? Those who are equal to nothing. They alone are equal to God. The divine being is equal to nothing, and in it there is neither image nor form. To the souls who are equal, the Father gives equally, and he withholds nothing at all from them. We touch here upon a, 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 a great truth about this form of cognitive mysticism, which is that the highest form of mysticism and atheism lie very cheek by jowl are very close together. The affirmation that God is all and the affirmation that God is nothing come very close together, you see, because the emphasis is on no thing. And, and so the otherness of God um, is stressed to the point where God's isness appears as much as absence as by presence. He says in Sermon 6 again, we shall be completely transformed and changed into God. That's his quotation from 2 Corinthians 3.18, and it's a loose translation. See a comparison. In the same way, when in the sacrament bread is changed into the body of our Lord, however many pieces of bread there were, they still become one body. This is that Eucharistic connection again. Just so, if all the pieces of bread were changed into my finger, there would still not be more than one finger. But if my finger were changed into the bread, there would be as many of one as of the other. What is changed into something else becomes one with it. I am so changed into him that he produces his being in me as one, not just similar. By the living God, this is true. There is no distinction. It's no wonder that, that um, Eckhart was brought for charges of heresy because it, this, this language is just extraordinarily bold. Um, his student was Johannes Tauler, uh, whose dates are 1300 to 1361. Um, he spent his ministry in preaching at Strasbourg and Basel. 
He softened Meister Eckhart's emphases without totally rejecting them. He worked closely with a very pious group of lay people called the Friends of God, who pursued the path of mystical experience and preached to them as well as to communities of Dominican nuns. His German sermons are very easy to read, quite the contrast from Eckhart, and possess a solid piety that is suffused with quiet passion. There's no wonder that Martin Luther declared him his favorite German preacher. Tauler is very accessible. A, a small sample, which comes from his sermon on Christmas Day. Today, Holy Christendom commemorates a threefold birth, which should so gladden and delight the heart that enraptured with joyful love and jubilation, we should soar upward with sheer gratitude and bliss. And whoever cannot experience this ought to be quite distressed. The first birth, and the most sublime, is that in which the Heavenly Father begets His only Son within the divine essence, yet distinct in person. So this is the inner life of the Trinity. The Father begets the Son. It's a birth. The second birth we commemorate is that of maternal fruitfulness brought about in virginal chastity and true purity. That's the birth of Jesus by the Virgin Mary. The third birth is affected when God is born within a just soul every day and every hour, truly and spiritually, by grace and out of love. These are the three births observed in today's three holy masses. So we see that the, the connection between the birth of God and the human soul, precisely through mystical experience based in grace, is participates in the birth of God in Jesus Christ, which participates in the birth of the Son in the divine trinity. It's all a single ladder. So he said, we need to consider first how a man should return to his source, the road he should travel, and the means he should use to arrive at his goal, as well as the obstacles which prevent him from achieving his goal. So he then goes into a discussion of what are the obstacles that prevent us from realizing this birth of God within us. The final Rhineland mystic is Henry Suso, again a Dominican. His dates are 1300 to 1366. He also studied with Eckhard in Cologne, but spent his life in pastoral work in Constance and Ulm. He was also associated with the group called the Friends of God, and he worked for restoring religious observance, especially among Dominican nuns. He traveled as a preacher and provided spiritual direction to many. His work, called The Exemplar, contains four distinct parts. The Life of the Servant, which is highly autobiographical, the Little Book of Eternal Wisdom, the Little Book of Truth, and the Little Book of Letters. The Little Book of Eternal Wisdom and the Little Book of Truth are his main spiritual wisdom. The Little Book of Letters is simply a collection of letters that he wrote to various people he was teaching. Most fascinating for us is the life of the servant, which recounts his own spiritual um, journey. I think one of the things that is really striking about Henry Suso is we find a path that is not unusual for those in the religious life uh, who belong to a religious order that is dedicated to a life of asceticism and prayer. He began with what might be called the, the mystical moment, a moment when he was somehow convicted by the presence of God, that he was stunned by the reality of the presence of God. And that experience was followed by his effort to make that more permanent, which took the form of very severe physical mortification and the kinds of asceticism, of control of the passions, and so forth. What is fascinating is that he kept on missing the point in all of this, as so many people who pursue this path do. At, at some level, Henry acknowledges that he thought it was about him. He thought he could actually bring this about. And what he began to finally understand was that the highest point of the mystical life was not about him, it was not about the self, it was about God. 
And the final stage for him was the passing away of self, where he became so detached from self-preoccupation that he became really aware for the first time of God's presence in other people, and that that was the reality toward which God was really calling him. 